Um, on to the afternoon's sessions, beginning with James Goldrick. James. Thanks, Peter. Thank um, I've just completed a study of the war in northern European waters, that's the North Sea, Norwegian Sea, the Baltic, in from after the Battle of Jutland until uh, the armistice. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is three um, points that have come out from our research of interest. Uh, one is uh, a point that's come out of what I call new technology and the way that's going to cause us to look at things differently. The second is an example of where social history um, has been concentrated on perhaps a bit much uh, and we need to go back to technology and material to understand better what's going on. And the third is uh, an element of social history uh, which has already been touched on I think in uh, some of the conversations we've had already which I think may be worth a look. Now. That is the wreck of AE-1, uh, which was recently discovered uh, off Rabol after many searches. It was found by a combination of a couple of things, which are the same case for the discoveries as in the Cormorant and the Sydney, a combination of carefully going back to primary sources, looking at those and understanding what they're saying, and then using emergent technology in the terms of multi-beam sonars to actually find the wrecks. Now, the extent to which this uh, is important is that, particularly for submarines in the First World War, I was finding, working on 1916-18, that a very large number of submarines either disappeared or their losses are uncertain. And what I had to do was, if that was the case in any of the primary sources, or indeed the secondary sources, you go online and the chances are it's already been found and in the last decade and indeed in the last few years. Now, this is a multi-beam sonar picture of UB-85 which was discovered in 2016 by some oil rig people. Um, and this gives you the uh, sort of look at what you can see from a multi-beam sonar. Um, I'll do one parenthesis. As MH370 has shown, it doesn't matter how good the sonar technology is if you don't know where something is pretty closely, you won't find it. And as David Stevens has reminded me, global positioning system is really important. Once you've found the location of a wreck, you can go back and find it again. But I want to give you this instance of why, why it really matters. This is UB29, which was discovered in 2017 by a Belgian diver. Uh, it wasn't identified for some time, basically because it's underneath the main shipping channel. And as the diver himself said, if you're trying to look at a wreck in those circumstances, it's like doing an archaeological dig on a motor highway. <laughs> um, because it's quite shallow. Uh, that's a sketch of the UB-29. Now, the thing is, UB-29, what's significant is she's supposed to be the first U-boat that was sunk by depth charges. Uh, HMS, HMS Landrail, the destroyer shown in the picture here, had a set two with her, uh, rammed her, uh, believed she'd given her conning tower a glancing blow and in theory finished her off with depth charges. <coughs> now this wreck was location was known but it wasn't known to be a submarine until 2017 and it wasn't known to be a World War One U-boat until that point and earlier this year uh, by taking off um, a couple of things and you can see the picture of the UB-29 tag it was discovered to be UB-29. Now UB-29, as I say, is the first submarine thought to have been sunk by depth charges. Well, she wasn't. <laughs> Presumed location is off the Goodwin Sands, uh, shown there in, with the uh, red block. She was actually found um, about 50 nautical miles closer to Zeebrugge, um, and she had been mined. She'd been hit by a mine. Now, this is what I mean about significance, and I think there's going to need to be a whole look, particularly at the U-boat war, um, as to exactly what did happen to quite a lot of submarines and how the things worked out. Uh, by the way, and I'm delighted Richard Dunley has now joined us at University of New South Wales, Canberra, um, as the naval historian, uh, we'll, tell, we'll talk about mine warfare. If you look at 1916-18, mines really matter. And it's only once the British get both their defensive and offensive mining campaigns right that the German U-boat campaign and the German Navy as a whole are in big, big trouble. And I think Richard will be telling us some of the reasons why the British didn't get round to getting things right for quite a long time. Okay, my second thing is 
the, ger the narrative of the German Navy, um, this idea of the high seas fleets collapse, it's, uh, the historiography, particularly in, German, in Germany, is very strongly about the collapse socially in morale and politically of the German Navy. And there are good reasons for that, and in particular, uh, not only is it looking back uh, as to what happened, but to be fair, this sort of history in German terms after World War II was more acceptable. Now, it's still a big issue, uh, and I'll give you an instance of why it's a big issue. The German Navy doesn't know how to remember these mutineers of this year, or indeed 1917, when a number were shot who were ringleaders of the abortive mutinies of that period. Interestingly enough, the Navy of East Germany celebrated them as heroes, <laughs> and the German, West German Navy did nothing of the sort, and the German Navy is still conflicted about how to remember these people. But what I want to make the point is that I've realised that there is another side which is not properly understood about the collapse of the German Navy, and here's a vignette which will indicate what I'm getting at. The high sea fleet did not stay in harbour after Jutland. It's a lot more complex than that. But this is a key sortie <coughs> that they made in April 1918 with the idea of intercepting uh, a convoy on the, what was called the Scandinavian convoy running between uh, Scandinavia and Scotland. Um, and this is where the German fleet went the furthest from its ports in World War I. Now, the, the sortie failed for two reasons. One is the Germans had got their uh, intelligence wrong and it was the wrong day so there was no convoy. But the second was that the battle cruiser Monke suffered a catastrophic failure. She lost, and the picture here is of her near sister Seidlitz after being salvaged from Scarpa Flow, but she lost the propeller shaft of her starboard inner propeller shaft. Literally, there was uh, the A bracket as shown here failed and the propeller fell off with that part of its shaft. Fairly catastrophic. The point is that although they're able to get Moltke back by some really good work, um, the reason why this happened was Moltke had run aground in December 1916 near Wilhelmshaven. They'd done a bodgy repair job and it had never been properly fixed. Now this is the front line supercarrier type unit of the German Navy and they've done a bodgy repair job which they've let go for 16 months. What does that tell you about the material state of the German fleet? And here is where I think, uh, and it will have to, I think, have to be led by the Germans, but I must admit I'm going to be trying to do what I can. We need a much better idea of what is actually the material state, because I'm now the view the German Navy was falling apart. There's a lot of other evidence about material failures, um, resource failures. What we don't know is why are they falling apart. Is it lack of skilled labour in the ships? They're 30% down on their officer engineers. Is it lack of skilled labour in the dockyards? Is it not having the metal, the lack of copper after 1916, and so on and so on. But the German Navy is materially falling apart as well as socially. Finally, what about the wives? Uh, here you see a picture of, uh, on the left, is Ethel Beatty, done by the uh, painter Laszlo, with her husband, done by Orpen, uh, David Beatty, and on the right you have Admiral Jellico and Gwendolyn Jellico. It is quite clear to me, um, although the caricature of a would-be biography of Beatty is that the Admiral's wives were a race unto themselves, um, that these people deserve a much closer look in their own right. These are highly intelligent people. They influence the political debate. There is no question after the war that these two women exacerbated the Jutland controversy that divided the Navy into two. But in the war, I think it's quite, you know, we're not looking at them in their own right as highly intelligent women, and they were, who obviously had their own concerns and challenges. We've always tended to look at them in the context of their husbands rather than going, OK, let's look at that person. And I genuinely think these and other people need to be looked at. Um, it'll be a big job, but I think it's worthwhile doing. As I say, these are highly intelligent people in their own right. And I'll just finish with uh, one point. There is one example of this in the literature. It's the Royal Navy and the Curra incident. Uh, Ian Beckett um, co-authored uh, an article on that quite a few years ago. I've actually seen the, pap the Weems papers. Lady Weems, who's the daughter of Sir Robert Moria, the diplomat, 
is much more at the centre of the conspiracy that is clearly developing in the Royal Navy to support the army in the Curragh incident against the government than her husband. Thank you.